Sure. Well, hello everyone. Salam alaikum from Dubai. Um, I'm going to. What I want to do is keep it reasonably interactive. So I'm going to have a bunch of questions as I go through this. Um, I had a little bit of technical problem with uh, sharing um, keynote, but we'll give it another go. But you should be able to see most of what I want to say. So we'll just have a quick share of that one. So are you seeing the entire screen, or are you just seeing the um, the the presentation mode, the, the the keynote mode? We're seeing keynote mode, but that's fine. We'll be able to see okay. it. Okay, no, no problem. We'll see it fine from here. So what I want to do is I want to talk about I want to talk about three things why psychological safety is critical to high-performing teams and organisations. I want to talk about some of the bad practices I've been seeing since the pandemic and also some of the good practices I've been seeing. So who am I? What do I do? So I, I live in Dubai and I consult for organisations in business agility and organisational adaptivity. Um, mostly here in the Middle East, uh, but also in APAC as well. And I deal with medium sized and large, medium to large sized businesses, uh, telcos, banks, that type of thing. So what I'm going to be telling you today is not statistically significant. It's coming from conversations I've been having with my clients over the last six or seven months. And so that's about probably all up about eight or nine organisations. Uh, and so um, this is not when I say bad practices, good practices, this is what I'm experiencing and this is why I want to have a bit interactive to see what, what you people are seeing out there. Let's just quickly uh, talk about how I got here. So a couple of years ago, I wrote an article saying why is psychological safety being ignored? And this was on the back of some uh, masterclasses I was running in Hong Kong and in Australia around the notion of psychological safety. Um, the interest has been growing slowly over time, but it's not phenomenal. Um, at the moment, it's, you know, it's a conversation which is a little bit more known about um, two years ago than it, than it, than it was then, uh, but it's not huge on the agenda of organisations, um, you know, executives of organisations, which is, which is surprising. Um, so just to define it, uh, often people think about psychological safety as being a um, domain of Amy Edmondson's, but it actually came from the father of employee engagement, William Kahn. And he states that psychological safety is being able to show and employ oneself without fear of negative consequences of self-image, status or career. So when we talk about psychological safety, that's what we're talking about. And Amy Edmondson then took it, um, this concept, and did a lot of studies with it. And, and then if you've heard of it, it's probably through Amy rather than William. And probably the most famous study was Google's Project Aristotle. And this is probably one of the most interesting organizational development studies ever done because Google were able to try to find out how teams were, high performing teams worked. And they conducted a parallel experimentation across 180 teams. And to their surprise, because this is not what they're looking for, to their surprise, psychological safety came out as the number one driver of high performance. And what they're able to find is that individuals in psychologically safe teams were less likely to leave. Uh, they're more likely to harness the power of diverse ideas from teammates. Each of these teams brought in more revenue and they were rated as highly affected by executives much more than the other teams. And the reason that they, the, the researchers said the psychological safety was so critical was that the other good high functioning team functions such as dependability, clarity, meaning, impact, all depended on psychological safety. If you didn't have the psychological safety in place, the other things would fall apart. So I uh, just wanted to, we want to clarify something here. Now, there's a big difference between a psychologically safe place and psychological safety. So psychological safety, as Amy Edmondson said, is not the same as a safe place. It is not a space where you always feel comfortable and not have your views challenged. It is almost the opposite. It's a brave space. And she charts or teams within um, these domains. There's, there's high or low psychological safety and high or low accountability for meeting demanding goals. And 
if there is a lot of accountability for meeting demanding goals and low psychological safety, you get a lot of anxiety. And in my um, work over the last six or seven months, I'm seeing a lot of this. And we'll see why this is happening. Hey, John, if you're yeah. switching slides, it's not switching. You're going to need to click on the sidebar to show us the slides because we can't see your, present, your presenter mode. So wow, I'm, I'm having a bad time here, aren't I? How about I stop, stop sharing and um, maybe start all over again. Share this one. Um, can you see, what can you see now? Yep, emotional circuits, mammalian and brains. Yep, so just okay. don't do presenter mode, just click your sidebar and we'll see. Yep. Okay, so just, just going back then, um, can you see the anxiety zone, learning zone now or not? Yep. You can. Okay, I think I'll stop using the, um, the, the play button and just use the sidebar. Okay, so what I was saying before is that, uh, can you see my mouse moving or not? Yes, we can. Okay, so what I'm finding is there's a lot of people uh, in teams that they are trying to get a lot done, it's very demanding, and psychological safety has decreased during the pandemic. And so you get, they're in this anxiety zone. Um, okay, the other slides, um, we'll just have to skip over. So in order to understand the, the criticality of psychological safety, we need to understand the emotional circuits of mammalian brains. And for this, we go to the work of Jark Panske. And he mapped out um, the, the neurology of emotions in mammals. And there's two particular things that we're interested in. In fact, um, uh, Brock and Erkin might even start to view these as polarities between fear and seeking. And um, th these are neurochemical um, transmitters. So a fear system and a seeking system are different neurochemical transmitters in different parts of the brain that activate, as is the rage and the panic system. But we're only really interested in the fear and the seeking system. And um, Jack, he was, he was known as the rat tickler. And one of the things he did was to um, stimulate play and, and the seeking system in rats. And the seeking system is what we, what we really want in team members. This is where we're going out and exploring and, and learning. And the fear system turns that off. And so one of the things he did is he was able to find um, rat laughter at a certain frequency and he could tickle the rats and the rats would play. And then he introduced some cat fur into the cage and the fear system would overwrite the, the seeking system. The, the seeking system would shrink back. But what, was, what he found is it took a long time to reignite the positive emotions and behaviours of the rat. It took days, and sometimes it never came back at all. And this has been repeated in different mammals, and we, we actually know this effect today. You know, we, if our fear system is triggered too hard, it stays for a long time, and, and we call it post-traumatic stress disorder. It has deep neurological, pro it, it manifests deep neurological problems. So just very quickly, before we go much further, ha have you or your colleagues experienced symptoms of, of a toxic culture during the pandemic. And so the, what creates the fear is a toxic culture. And there is a, a whole bunch of these are the most common symptoms that um, most common uh, impacts on well-being that toxic cultures create. So in the, in the chat, have any of you, your colleagues, experienced any of those? And um, and what? So it may be, um, Sherry, if you could read any out that come up. Because I can't see them. Sure will. Feeling undervalued. Anxiety. Yep. Sorry. Social isolation. Frustration. Yep. Okay. Fear. Mm -hmm. 
so this is happening. So we are, so this audience is also starting to see the, these type of impacts coming through their organizations, coming from society, through the organizations, through the teams. And the research kind of shows us that, that this is happening at a quite a large scale. So, you know, mental health problems are increasing significantly um, since the, the start of the COVID. And so it becomes really, really, really important to manage the psychological safety in your team, even more important than it was before. Now, what I want to do is just repeat, I'm just going to be talking about some bad practices and um, they're not, it's not total. There'll be other bad, bad practices, but these are the ones which I'm seeing a pattern of with the clients that I'm dealing with. And the first one is it's really widespread and, it's, and other people have called it the pandemic of uncertainty. And psychologist Kate Sweeney um, quite accurately says that people would rather deal with the certainty of bad news than the anxiety of remaining limbo. And almost every single organisation that I've been dealing with reported this at every level, except the very the top, top management. And it was like, it, it's almost like we're certainty-seeking certainty, certainty seeking creatures. And in an absence of information, it creates a great deal of anxiety. But the information could be anything. You know, the, the metaphor is a bit like a, a ship and we're on a, on, a, on a sailing ship or a cruise ship and we hit really bad weather. And the captain's not talking to us. We don't know if the wet bad weather is going to you know, last for a long time. We don't have a radar. We don't know whether there's rocks. And we want some kind of certainty. We want to, we want to know, even if the captains and, the, and the, the pilots don't know, as long as they can communicate, saying we've encountered you know, some bad weather, um, we don't think it's going to last too long, or we think it is, any information is really important. But we're not seeing it. And so this is some of the interviews from some of the senior people that I've been talking to. When I say senior people, I'm talking about level three uh, management, management levels out of maybe 12. So I wish senior management would just let us know what they are thinking. Even if it's bad, just treat us like adults. It would take so little effort just to let us know what the situation is, even for the next few months. We are getting no information from above. Do they even understand the problem? So this came a time and time and time again. Senior leadership was not communicating down. So here's the next question is, you know, has you in your organizations, have you experienced high levels of uncertainty and dread? And if so, how did that make you feel? Sure, if you could read out any responses, that'd be great because I can't see them. Sorry, I need to unmute. Unwell. Sorry, what's that? Um, one person said yes, they felt unwell. Yep. Antsy. Antsy. Mm -hmm. Lack of direction. Yeah, it's, it's, it's extremely stressful. And I don't know about organisations, um, you know, with the audience here has been interfacing with, but almost across the board, uh, the organisations in the Middle East, and some of them in APAC, in Hong Kong and Singapore, were very, very, very bad at communicating. And it really generated a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress for people. So the next negative pattern we saw, and people might be aware of Goodhart's law, um, which is when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure, was the over-focus on productivity and confusing that with performance. So what do we mean by this? So, one of the patterns I started to notice was that a lot of the managers started saying, actually, our productivity is going up. You know, people are meeting their SLAs. They're meeting their targets. And, but when I pushed them, I said, well, that's great. So, you know, should we introduce this level of stress all the time? Should we throw people at home? Should we, we socially isolate them? 
And they said, no, 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 no. Although our, our SLA is going up, people are hitting the SLA's, the performance is going down. You know, and I thought, you know, what do you what do you mean? And the the typical response would be that well, people are making mistakes all over the place. And so I'd ask further, well, what sort of mistakes are people making? And they would say things like, well, they're mixing up pathology results. So, you know, in the health departments and, and people are working so hard, they're, they're meeting their SLAs, they're, they're doing the number of tests per, per, per day, but they're so tired and they're so stressed, they're mixing people's results up, which is pretty serious. It's a real problem with performance. Here's another quote. People are afraid to call in sick or seek medical advice in case they get flagged. They're beyond stress. Their hair is falling out. Two people have dropped dead at work. So people are so driven by fear to meet these targets. The targets are going through the roof, but people are literally dying on the job. So back to questions for the, 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 the for you guys. Are your organizations also highly focused on metrics? And if so, what are some of the consequences that you're seeing with an over-focus on meeting SLAs and KPIs and metrics? And again, Sherry, if you could read that out, it'd be tremendous. Yep. Just waiting on answers. Yes, everyone's focus is to make numbers green versus customer value. Right. Okay. So the, ne the next, next layer of this, you know, it gets worse. And um, one of the, the patterns which we've seen is the rise of employee monitoring software. Employee monitoring software has done very, very, very well. And th that's a quote from one of the, um, you know, one of the many employee monitoring software's websites. Quickly identify your team superstars, time thieving slackers and in-betweeners. So <laughs> organizations have sent people home to work and they put on board they on their computers and their, their their mobile devices digital monitoring software now that little figure to the right um, i'm not too sure if anyone knows what that is it's that's a diagram of jeremy bentham's bentham's panopticon and in the 18th century uh, jeremy bentham designed what he saw as the ideal prison and the idea was, it was highly efficient. In the middle of the prison was your prison guard. And they would look out into, uh, in, into the radius of the, the prison into cells, pointing towards them. But the real genius was this, these blinds and shutters that uh, Bentham invented so that the prisoners never knew if the guard was in the tower or not. And so they were always under the anticipated gaze of the guard. And he called that a panopticon. You know, you, uh, everywhere all seen. Now, most people, if they're in, sitting at, in their, at their desk and their boss walks up and stands next to them or stands over their shoulder, you know, they change their behaviour. They, they sit up a bit more upright or they, they focus a bit more on their screens. There's a bit of tension. Now imagine that this is happening all the time with, with digital surveillance. It's driving people completely nuts. But it doesn't have to be as overt as um, the employee monitoring software. This, this stuff, I don't know if anyone's using it, but it'll take um, screenshots, including video screenshots of your screen every few seconds. And so that you can literally re replay an employee's entire day. Um, it'll track their GPS location so you can see if they've, they've gone to the supermarket or gone to the bathroom. 
I mean, it's really invasive stuff. But it doesn't have to be even, it doesn't have to be so invasive. It can even be simple things like, um, you know, group where notifications. So one of my clients, they said, look, you know, people are expected to work 24 seven here. Um, if they don't respond instantly to a base camp notification, they assume to be non-productive. It's extremely stressful. So back to the questions. So is there some form of, form of surveillance in your organization? And if so, how does it make you feel? Well, we're waiting for answers for that. Just a few of the answers that came up on data after you, yep. um, after we went on. No, there, my organizations move towards focusing on employees and customers, and they're already in the middle of a health initiative before the pandemic. Um, Good to hear. Another one on data was, yes, a lot of data and metrics are collected. New ones are introduced, but the data is not being used or interpreted in the correct way. So it creates more frustration, fear, and uncertainty. Um, answers for the current question is, yes, it makes me feel untrusted. Yes. And not, no others yet. Okay. I mean, I think this is extreme. You know, I haven't heard too many organizations, in my client base, there's not too many. I was really reporting on more of a global phenomenon of this. Okay, let's look at a, um, one more bad practice. And it's not so much a practice, but it's more of an outcome. And so one of the things I've been seeing is, is observing is the increase in, in backbiting or, or slander. And this is when people are trying to shift the blame for performance onto another colleague so that they aren't the ones, the, they aren't the ones who are going to get um, shortlisted for termination. It'll be their colleagues. And so some of the um, quotes coming back is, that, you know, from organisations, are you know, someone would rather throw you under a bus and admit a mistake. And, uh, you know, here we protect ourselves at whatever cost. There is no team, there's just I. And so this, out of my client base, this wasn't common, but there was, in the larger organisations, and one large organisation in particular, it was rampant. And it almost seemed like the more the organisation was going to be hit by downsizing, the more economic damage it was going to, going to take, um, the worse the backbiting got. And uh, so... And, and, and this is, it's a kind of a fear response, isn't it? So backbiting comes from uh, the old blood sport of bear baiting, where the dogs used to back the bite of the back, the bite the back of the bears. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a really, really, really toxic thing to do. So in, in your organisations, have you seen an increase of it, in backbiting, mean or spiteful spe speech? And if so, why do you think that might have happened? I'm, I'm hoping no one's actually seen that, but let's, let's hear from the audience. All right, just a few answers from the last one that are up. Um, there is... Uh, surveillance is even more of a reason to remain a freelance. It isn't, yeah. and someone else said, it isn't this kind of surveillance, but there's presenteeism whereby people seem to feel they need to be online 24 hours a day and respond. That's definitely something you mentioned. Um, yeah, that's actually a really good point, whoever said that. That, that presenteeism is, is, you know, if I had more time, I would have almost put that in there. But that's also a pattern which I'm seeing a lot of, you know, and well said, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So also not sure my company has surveillance, but in some sense, the company has a right to do so. But transparency, definitely. Um, make it clear what's being tracked is important and how the collected data will be used. Another is, um, is anything more support, supporter, support tribe in 2020? Um, and then let's see, blaming someone is much easier than taking responsibility. So that sounds like a comment from this question. 
Another one from this question is glad that we haven't seen it yet, but when economics go down, large layoffs, downsizing, um, then not sure how people will behave. Yeah. True. Okay. Yeah. That's all for this one so far. Great. So just to repeat, these are the observations which I've, I've been seeing over the last um, six or seven months. And what I've also been observing is that there are some teams or, and, and some team leaders and, and organisation leaders. When I say teams, some of the teams are pretty big. You, know, you could, could call them a division, really. Um, there are some very good examples of some people doing great things. And um, I'd like to share those things with you. There's a pattern. And, and I think that's what the real, the real value of this is, is to say, well, we, we kind of know there's a big problem out there. I've given you some ideas to, to label them. But what can we really do to ensure that psychological safety increases in, the, in our organisations? So the very first one is communicate authentically and model vulnerability. So I'm not too sure, I'm, you know, if you haven't seen Brene Brown's TED Talks and her talkings, you know, she, she really talks about it very well. And, you know, in her words, she says, authenticity is a collection of choices that we have to make every day. It's about the choice to show up and be real, the choice to be honest, the choice to let our true selves be seen. And, you know, time and time again, I'm seeing really good leaders speak authentically. So what do I mean by that? So one of the things that they're doing is that they are saying it as it is. And even if they are unsure about where the organization is going in the next few months, they are sharing with what they, are, what they believe. And they don't sugarcoat it. They will say things like, um, look, we are still heading into really rough waters. Um, I think I think it's you know it's, it would be wise for everyone to sharpen up their LinkedIn resume. I am. This is coming from a leader, of a fairly senior leader, several thousand people. Um, sometimes organisations will. Um, mute the official communications could happen as you know that they will they will muzzle the mid-level managers they'll say you cannot say that we don't know or you we cannot you cannot say when when these things are going to be restricted because they, they are afraid there could be some kind of hr backlash and so the authentic leaders when they are not allowed to say something because of policy, they go out of their way to telegraph it. They go out of their way to send signals to their teams and the rest of the organisation that something is afoot and that they can't necessarily say this. And the difference between these teams are quite significant. In one organisation, we can see where there's a, a authentic leader who's modelling her vulnerability compared to similar size, similar um, team sizes and constituents with leaders that aren't doing that, the performance is quite substantial. Um, the, the leaders where, who are driving high psychological safety with uh, authenticity and vulnerability, their teams are performing. And where we're seeing in the same organisation, um, leaders who are shutting down and sugarcoating and acting brave and acting tough, not brave really, tough is the word, keeping a stiff upper lip, all of their team members are really suffering and, and um, the performance is down. So I'll give you some examples of those in a minute. But um, one of the other practices which the really good leaders are doing is they're creating check-ins. So no longer has the organisation got the, the corridors and the liminal spaces where people can, ha can have social time and, and go aside and have a bit of a chat about how they're feeling? And also they realise that with Zoom, a lot of the perceptiveness has gone down. We're not seeing people's faces as much. We're not reading their emotions. We're not picking up the suburb cues. 
and so the good leaders, the good um, psychologically safe leaders, are creating new spaces on Zoom where they are creating just very safe places for people to check in. And they are showing their vulnerability. So, for example, um, I asked one of the senior leaders, you know, what she did. How does she show her vulnerability? And she said, well, I just shared that I wasn't sleeping well. And I asked if others weren't having difficulty too, were having difficulty too. A very simple thing to say, but quite profound. Because she's not saying that I'm coping with this. She's saying that I'm having trouble and I, we know that you're having trouble. And this is, this is a separate meeting. These are check-in meetings. These are not at the front or the back of other meetings. These are special meetings which, which good leaders have created just for the sake of checking in. With all of and sometimes they do it with the group and sometimes if they feel that one or two individuals need some special time, they, they take that off as well. And in, in several organisations I work with where I can see the difference between uh, high, highly psychologically safe teams and, and low psychological safety teams, it's this, this check-in and this human touch which makes all the difference, especially making themselves vulnerable. And finally, I'm going to leave, then I'm going to open up a little bit of discussion. Um, one of the things which is going to happen um, is that we're going to see a lot of layoffs. We're going to see second and third order economic effects. And some of the people in this room might have to lay people off. And um, you're going to have to learn to do it with compassion. And this is a, a, a small story from a friend of mine who got made redundant. And um, this is what he wrote. He went, I, you know, I feel redundant. I am redundant. Those words sit heavily on my shoulders. I feel like Atlas. The world around me darkens and my hand shakes ever so slightly as I sign the document that cements the words. A business decision. Decision made. And like that, I'm gone. When we make people redundant, it is deeply, deeply emotional. It is you're tearing people away from not just an income, but friends, a sense of identity. You're throwing them into a world of unsecurity. It's very, very, very difficult. So what are the good people doing? What are the good leaders doing that are make, laying off with compassion? They don't sugarcoat the information. They get to the point pretty quickly. So for example, they'll say, they'll call someone into the meeting, they'll say, I have some bad news. We have to make your job redundant. So they get it, they don't dilly-dally, they get to the point, they rip the band-aid off, and, and then they do something which is quite remarkable, I think. Um, they find, they, they stay up at night before this happens, and they'll go through each and every one of their employees, and they'll think about something personal, personal about that employee, that's a compliment. And they will make a lot of effort to make sure that, that employee realises that they weren't let go because of anything to do with their performance or their behaviour or anything, but that it was economic, dire economic circumstances. And then they say, you know, I particularly want to thank you for, and they think of individual stories for your work on this. I saw you doing this. I've seen how well you've behaved over the last couple of years. I've seen your work. And they make personal, personal contributions. Some of them will actually write thank you notes, personal thank you notes. They do not treat people en masse. They take an enormous amount of time, an enormous amount of effort to treat each person as a human individual. And the teams that don't do so well, they send them an email. That's it. They don't even have a phone call. They don't have the courage to face the people. So if you do, and I hope you don't, but if you do have to lay people off in your team, work out how to deal with compassion. Because there's actually a fair bit of articles online, Harvard Business Review at bottom, but work out how to do it. It's so important. It's so important for the person, it's so important for you, and it's also important for the people that, that you leave behind, or sorry, the people that are left behind. So with that, I mean, I've given you a bit of a, a, a quick tour of some of the insight that I've seen over the last few months. 
and some of the things which bad leaders and good leaders are doing. And so now we've got 10 minutes. So what are your takeaways here? And, and what is one thing that you can do, or two, you think you can do to increase psychological safety in your team? And I thought that we might make that a bit of a group discussion where people, you know, can rather than just chat, if you want to chat, you can, but if you want to unmute yourself and have a chat to the group, then, and share, to say this is what, I, you know, to be vulnerable yourself, um, to think about what is one good thing that you can do for your teams or your organisation. I thought it might be a good opportunity to have a go at that. What do you think? Everyone, you are welcome to turn on your cameras and unmute if you want to um, contribute. We'd love to hear your um, what you've got to say. On the horror? Yeah. I, I started recently, but I will share uh, the, the topic is exactly on the same point. I'm working, at least I can take care of the bridging the gap between leadership and the teams. What are the leadership thoughts? Where does the organization want it to be? And even during the transformation, what are the goals? Clearly share with the teams or even engage them in the change conversations. That's the one thing at least I'm trying to bridge between the teams and then, because when I had uh, multiple one-on-one -on -one discussions with the team, members individually, sorry for the background noise. Uh, You're right. Yeah, what they mentioned was, at the end it comes to the delivery teams, we do not know why we are doing this. All I am doing is move the bricks from one place to the other place, that's it. Thank you, Manaha. While we wait for others to uh, join, I was um, I wanted to mention that um, that last point you talked about about compassionate layoffs. Um, definitely seeing companies where you know you go to work and someone taps you on the shoulder and walk you out. Um, but through this pandemic, I've, I've actually seen some companies do really well. My daughter works for an uh, airline, and we all know how bad the airline um, industry got hit. But they handled this so compassionately. They, um, as soon as they, you know, things started to fail, they let their employees know, we don't know what's going to happen. We just know that we'll let you know when we figure it out. Then they came back and said, you know, we got um, a grant from the government. Everybody's job is safe till September, but we will be laying off at the end of September. We just don't know what yet. They came back and said, okay, we've decided we have to cut 30% of our business. We don't know who yet, but we will let you know. They came back again and said, okay, now we have the list. They did that. Um, in mid mid August, now we have the list. We want to let you know who's going to be laid off at the end of September, and what options are. So people knew way in advance. They they didn't hide things. They they were just very open, and and it helped people to plan their lives. And so I was really impressed. Um, in the midst of the horribleness, how well they did and how much they cared for their employees. That's actually very good to hear. Um, and I've heard um, some bad stories from airlines and I've also heard a, one good story from airlines. We might chat to see if it's the same one offline, but we shouldn't say it publicly. <laughs> right. All right, anybody else? What are, what are some of your takeaways, some of your stories? We've got about 10 minutes left. You'd like to share. 